Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 232, recorded on March 16th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. This week, Arch Linux turned 20 years old. And we thought we should start the show out this week by wishing Arch, the project, and the many people behind it a happy birthday. No, it's not quite old enough to drink, but you really shouldn't use Pac-Man under the influence anyway. Arch has seen distros come and go, the rise of SystemD, the introduction of Wayland, Pulse Audio for that matter. But it was first released way back on March 11th, 2002, a simpler time for the Linux desktop, and Arch 0.1 had a nice simple code name at that, Homer. Since then, they've managed to mostly keep things simple, while also building out an incredible user repository, a wiki that I still use even when I'm not using an Arch system, and an amazing amount of community goodwill. That's why, even though I get pretty excited about Fedora these days and still have some Ubuntu machines laying around, of course, Arch, I think, will always remain one of my go-to distros. And I know you've had a few mean Arch desktops over the years, Chris. Are you actually still using it, though? <laughs> I have. I do. I have, well, we have two boxes in the studio, a desktop machine of mine that's just been a rock since, like, 2017. I have just slowly upgraded Arch on that thing, and it's been totally great. And then we have it on an old server here that it's still in transition, and uh, it's it's running on there in a server capacity, <laughs> also quite stable. It, we started it as, honestly, a years ago as a lark because the live audience was giving me the hardest time for not trying out Arch Linux. This is probably a decade ago. And I was like, all right, fine. You know, being a, a smart arse kid that I was, I was like, fine, I'll try a chat room. I'll see what your Arch user repository is all about. And I did a week-long challenge. And uh, we still have people that write into the show that say, hey, I started listening during the Arch Challenge. And I did a total deep dive into Arch and came away extremely impressed. I went from a skeptic to a true Arch believer. I try not to tell you about it all the time, by the way, but sometimes I just can't help myself. And I still love it. It might not be like my go-to distro for like a laptop these days. That tends to be Fedora. But for custom-built systems, maybe rigs that are going to have a really specific purpose, or when I'm trying out cutting-edge hardware, I always still turn to Arch. And I think part of that is because Arch hasn't changed much for the last 20 years. I mean, it's changed technologically, and it's changed with the Linux community in that way. But... I thought this was interesting in that uh, first release there, that Homer release, the 0.1 release, really. Arch was described as this. Arch Linux is an i686 optimized Linux distribution based on ideas from Crux. And then it goes on to say in the post, a default Arch install leaves you with a solid base. From there, you can add packages to create the custom installation you're looking for. That, 20 years later, is still perfectly it just perfectly describes arch still and i you got to give the project credit for that there's a that's a hard thing to really stick to over 20 years and by just nailing that basic promise a lot of people have come to love the distribution so happy birthday everybody after what has felt like years of rumors on march 15th google announced that steam for chrome os is finally here or, well, almost here? It's a little confusing. It is. It seems maybe the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing in this case at Google. So we dug into this just a little bit for the show. And I'm thinking they were planning to have everything lined up for this Google Game Developer Summit. And then the announcement and the slides and all that stuff kept going forward. And the bits that Chrome OS needed didn't. So a Google PR person confirmed that the Steam for Chrome OS stuff isn't actually available right now, like they said it was, but it should be in the near future. Okay, fair enough. That stuff can take time. Uh, and to no real surprise, they are initially targeting the higher-end Chromebooks. <laughs> okay. Also, 
Fair enough. Not not a surprise at all, really. But you're going to need something in there like a decent Intel or AMD x86-64 CPU. Not an ARM CPU. Those will not get support for this. Unfortunately, you're also probably going to need to have something that has somewhat of a graphics card on there. They have a list that we'll have linked in the show notes. Steam on Chrome OS is also leveraging, like you probably expected, those Linux application containers that Google built a little while ago. That means that Valve gets to use a lot of the stuff, well, pretty much everything they've already built for Steam on Linux. They don't have to like make a Chrome OS specific version. And and actually, speaking of Steam, Valve has sent the developer of Lutris, a Steam Deck, to help with development of Lutris. I mean, I just think that's pretty notable here because Lutris could be a tool that lets you bypass the Steam ecosystem if you chose to. You can participate with it as well, but it is essentially a competing tool that lets you use multiple different game stores. Yeah, I, I guess the hope here is that having an actual Steam Deck in hand should help further development on the Flatpak, as well as maybe hooking up anything special that's needed to get Lutris to work specifically on the Steam Deck. But yeah, I mean, as you say, like Lutris is not limited to the Steam ecosystem. Yes, it does work in the Steam ecosystem, but it works with a whole lot of other things too. So good on Valve for kind of continuing to keep up this commitment of the deck is just a Linux device. Yeah, I keep saying it's a PC. That If that doesn't underscore that philosophy, I, I don't know what else does. Um, and then just last bit of news on Steam. The Steam survey results for February 2022 have been clackulated. And uh, we just have a couple of notes. Just a, a reminder, though, that this is kind of a notoriously unreliable metric because the total Steam user base is always growing amongst all other kinds of things. But here's the figures you're probably interested in. In February of this year, Linux had a Steam market share of 1.02%. Unfortunately, that's down a little bit from 1.06% back in January. But taking a longer-term view, things look pretty healthy year over year. Way back in February last year, if you can remember that, Steam on Linux sat at 0.81%. Although, again, as you noted there, Chris, Steam's overall market share has definitely continued to increase significantly in that time. So it's a little difficult to make complete sense of these numbers. Yeah, I think we mostly just wanted to note it today because won't that number be pretty interesting in about a year from now? Not only has the deck been sent out to people who pre-ordered it, but likely in a year from now, hopefully, sales channels are loaded up, people have easy access to a deck. The number here could be pretty different. And that may also have the halo effect, as Apple used to call it, where perhaps people see the deck and decide, well, if I've got a deck now, maybe I also will try Linux on this machine and install Steam. We may see this number go up perhaps in a year. The thing we don't know at this point is how's Valve going to calculate those deck numbers? Are they going to lump it in with the general Linux scene? Are they going to break it out as a distro? Or is it going to be its own category altogether? We just don't have that answer yet. Michael Larbel over at Pharomix caught wind of a new Linux driver testing framework this week called Road Test. What immediately stood out to us about Road Test is it enables drivers to be tested under user mode Linux and makes it super simple to use mocked or modeled hardware. Yeah, modeled hardware. Isn't that interesting? So here's the problem they say they're trying to solve. Quote, most of the hardware is not available in current CI systems, so most drivers can only, at best, be build tested there. Even basic soundness, such as drivers successfully probing and binding to the devices it tries to support, cannot be tested. Drivers cannot be easily regression tested to ensure that bug-fixed code does not get reintroduced again. I think the key thing in there that they're talking about here is testers can use this modeled hardware to at least build some basic test coverage. And when you have a setup, which a lot of these hardware vendors do now, when you have a setup where you're building with a continuous integration system, anything more you can do there is, is going to be great, even if it's just some really basic stuff. Because I think it's not particularly robust, Wes. I think it's kind of basic. Yeah, it's definitely focused on just simple tests. Actually, the tests and hardware models themselves are written in Python, 
taking advantage of Python's built-in unit test framework. So no, this isn't going to give you the full set of capabilities that real hardware has. And of course, testing on real hardware is still important. But that's really difficult in CI systems, just given the huge nature of different types of hardware and parameters and configurations that hardware can be in. All of that makes development, modification, maintenance work, reviewing patches to these drivers, all of that is way harder than it actually needs to be. So Road Test hopes to make some of those things just a little bit easier. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support the show. You know everything we've deployed in the last, like, what, two and a half years? That's been on Linode. It's the Linux Geeks Cloud with 11 data centers around the world, and they've been hard at work for almost 19 years, creating the best experience for running your applications up there on the cloud. And you know, they're rolling out this new database as a service, and they've done it right. It's a MySQL project. They worked with the project there, and they have focused on getting it just right, and they're going to expand upon it. I actually haven't had a chance to try it yet, though. It's in beta right now, but I know Linode is going to nail it. You're going to have the expertise and the pros that know how to make Linode tick. They're going to be behind that, right? They're going to have that fast infrastructure and, of course, the great uptime. So I'm planning to try it, but if you get a chance to try it, let me know what you think. In fact, go sign up and try it out yourself and send me the feedback. I'll incorporate it in a future read. Linode.com slash land. Go get that $100 to try it. Linode has been rolling out screaming fast NVMe-based block storage recently. We use their super flexible S3 compatible object storage to power things like our next cloud or the backend storage for services that are always growing. If you want to deploy a matrix server like we have, Linode is great for that as well. Maybe you just want to use Linode for a few minutes to try something out. Or maybe you want to run your business infrastructure on there for the next 10 years. I know people that have been doing that, and I know that they've been loving it. And one thing that I hear over and over again from our audience is the support is incredible. When they need it, Linode's support has been outstanding. Great support, super fast rigs, crazy great networking, and 11 data centers to choose from. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons to like Linode. So let's put it over the top. Go grab that $100 in credit and support the show. Linode.com slash LAN. Do you hear that? Good Savings is calling Linux.ting.com. Thanks to Ting for sponsoring this episode. I've been a Ting customer since 2013. I love these guys. I mean, really, it's the way mobile should be done here in the States. They don't do it good enough. They didn't have to. They got in early. But I've heard from friends outside the country that say, you know, over here in our country, in our fancy country, this is how mobile has to be done. Ting is a mobile virtual network operator. They're a lean, mean fighting machine. They focus on the customer experience, value, picking the plans that are simple and straightforward, great device selection, that kind of stuff. Not greasing the wheels of politicians so that way they can dig a hole in the ground and stand up a tower. They don't bother with that. Instead, they work at the meta level. They rise above it. And they pick multiple networks that they can work with. Nationwide coverage. Great speeds, LTE, and 5G. And their customer support nails it when you need it. In fact, Ting was recently named the number one carrier by Consumer Reports in 2021. Ting's plans are simple and straightforward. It's just the smarter way to do mobile. And every single plan comes with that great support and no contracts ever. It's pretty simple to switch to Ting. Your phone's likely going to work. So go to linux.ting.com. Check your current phone. Create an account and pick a plan that's just right for you. Once everything's good to go, Ting will send you a SIM card. You're going to pop that in your phone. You'll get activated in minutes. You'll kind of feel bad for not doing this sooner. I went through that as well, but you're going to be so glad you did it. Start saving. Same great wireless experience, just better value. Linux.ting.com You'd be forgiven if you didn't happen to notice the release of GNOME 42 this week. It was uh, what you might call lacking in ceremony. But after a bug update to rename the release from RC to final, GNOME 42 has finally landed. However, before you get too excited about it, and there's a lot of reasons to get excited here, we should remind you that it will probably be a few weeks before it lands in a distribution near you. With the upcoming Fedora 36 and Ubuntu 2204, likely shipping it first. 
Now, the fact that it's not technically available in a distro easily didn't stop us from giving it a go just so we could get some impressions for you. Heck no. I got to start here with the visual look. They really took it to the next level. I wasn't sure what to expect because when GNOME 40 was announced, off in the far distance was this big transition coming to GNOME 42 that, that involved Libid Waddy and a new way of doing dark themes and themes on GNOME in general. And we just didn't know what that was going to materialize. But this 42 release is just blow away in the terms of visual refinements throughout the desktop in small little spots that I felt like didn't even need attention have gotten attention. And the GNOME developers have made real efforts to implement a system-wide dark mode that works here. And they've also included a couple of pre-selected dark and light wallpapers that look really great. And so when you pick a dark mode or a light mode in the appearance selector, it now also will adjust the wallpaper to be darker light, which just looks great. And on top of all of that, they're doing this smooth on-screen transition. They just nailed it. It looks so good. Like when they said they were going to do it, they committed to it and they did it right. This is some impressive work to see, definitely. But it's not all just shiny new shell work, no. There's been a whole bunch of stuff behind the scenes to continue the efforts to port things to GTK4, making a whole bunch of apps faster, and yes, uh, also shinier. One thing I have mixed feelings, though, about in this release is that our longtime reliable text editor, Gedit, is being replaced. But at least it's being replaced by a new text editor that also supports theming. Oh, okay, all right, all right. I'm picking up on a theme here, I think, Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, but you get it. It's too soon. And of course, as with every GNOME release, there's also a whole bunch of bug fixes, a last-minute crash fix, nice catch, guys, and performance improvements. Yeah, I think we'll have more on that, uh, specifically on the performance part, uh, coming up soon. I also wanted to mention, though, that what's nice about this release is it seemed to really kind of motivate the general GNOME ecosystem, too. So you see a lot of numerous third-party projects have been making improvements to try to land in time for GNOME 42. So a lot of GTK apps are getting some nice improvements there. So what we're going to keep doing is using it. I'll keep running it. Brent and Wes are going to give it a go. And we'll give it a review in Sunday's Linux Unplugged. We'll dig into some of the performance stuff and some of the areas they've improved, including how they're doing remote Windows and desktop applications with a full Wayland setup now. Because I know a lot of people who use that on X11 have been wondering what the solution is going to be for Wayland. That is now baked in, and we'll give that a try as well. So don't miss our coverage in Sunday's Linux Unplugged. And if you want to go get your hands on it, the Fedora 36 beta and Ubuntu 2204 betas are out there. Let us know what you think. But that does bring us to the end of this week's Linux Action News. If you would like to get this show every week ad-free, support the entire network and become a member at jupiter.party. You get all the shows ad-free with any of their bonus content, and it's the only way to get Linux Action News ad-free. But as always, you can get the show for absolutely free at linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe, where we have every single possible way in the universe to get the show. And once you've got it, well, let us know. LinuxActionNews.com slash contact. Hell yeah. And don't forget, our East Coast meetup is coming up real soon, April 9th in Raleigh, North Carolina. We'd love to see you there. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting for the details. We'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. <laughs> <laughs>